And g'day. We are on. We are on. Episode 140 of the Average Man Podcast. Happy Australia Day. Happy Australia Day to you, mate. How the bloody hell are you? So, um, it is Australia Day. It is Thursday, the 26th of January, and um, it's the first podcast I've done in a few weeks since we were on holidays. That's um, not 100% my fault. Well, I suppose it is my fault, but it wasn't my intention. I uh, I recorded a podcast the first weekend I was back, <clears throat> didn't save it, and I lost it when I went to publish it. And I was feeling, man, it was a good podcast too. It was a good 45 minutes. Um, I was feeling it. I was in the vibe. It was all happening and um yeah man it just didn't didn't record it uh, I, I didn't save it so i lost it so i was pretty spewing about that <clears throat> but what do you do I'm gonna move on and then the weekend after we had my parents uh my parents in my the in-laws my wife's parents in town so we kind of um you know the house was full the caravan was full uh, the kids had just got back so it just wouldn't give us the time so you know it kind of didn't happen for us uh unfortunately my setup's falling around, part around me here. I'm just going to bail out on what I was trying to achieve. I've got air cons running in here as well, um, so I was a bit worried about the background noise, but my little uh, soundproofing, makeshift soundproofing panels didn't really work. They just fell over. <coughs> but anyway, look, as I said, three weeks back, mate, it's a bit of a rerun of a podcast I did a couple of weeks ago with some extra shit added in because it is Australia Day, but it's the... We're three weeks back at work. Um, the, we had visitors last week. Kids are back now. School starts next week, so it's time to find that consistency again and um, start hitting the yeah hitting the podcast as a weekly thing. I've got a I've got a plan to make that happen, which is that I'm going to do them on Friday evenings, which I did with the one that I lost. Um, that way, I don't have to dedicate extra time to them over the weekend. I can do them um, on a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening before the kids. Um, before I pick the kids up, before everyone gets home from work, and then I can um, sort of edit them and, and, and air them over the over the weekend. So that should work a bit better for me. Anyway, uh, Australia Day. Before we move on, I'll, 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 I have, we'll have a little chat about Australia Day because each year I kind of kind of cover this this topic one way or another. I've generally done posts regarding it. Um, mom was a little, a little simpler today. Um, I basically just said, happy Australia day. I, I hope you're enjoying good food, good music with good people. And it's probably a good idea to, to, uh, acknowledge the traditional owners on whoever, on whose country you're, you're celebrating wherever you are in Australia. And also probably a good start and a good way to, to pay some respect is to have the conversation um, about what Australia Day means to other Australians, namely um, Indigenous Australians, and then possibly passing that information or having that conversation with your foreign friends, people who, who aren't uh, you know, born in Australia or uh, your children, uh, or we're just people who are a little um, ignorant to that conversation because it's not just um, celebrating Australia Day, Australia, you know, uh, um, the, the, the Australian flag being raised in Sydney Cove in 1788. Um, it it's, means a lot more uh, to Indigenous Australians and Torres Strait Islanders. It means like it's Invasion Day, it's Survival Day, it's... it's, it's it's celebrating, it's representing the, the day of the time when Europeans landed in Australia, raped and pillaged all the, the Indigenous people here and, and fucked up their whole world. Um, so let's not forget that. And, yeah, sure, it, we, I'm all about moving forward, moving on, living together, um, you know, bridging the gaps and the differences between the two cultures, um, not about, you know... Um, Dropping the bottom lip, sulking, putting you know anger and and, um, and holding on to the past negative in a negative way. I'm all about moving forward, mate. But let's let's acknowledge that that's that's what actually happened. That's what this means to to, to the traditional original culture, um, the indigenous people of Australia, and just 
just I, I don't I, I'm where this is leading is because obviously the background now last whatever it's been five six seven eight nine I'm not sure how many years but this whole change the date movement has become like a real thing that we can't talk about Australia Day without talking about the change the date movement which I'm not a fan of I don't agree with it um, I'm not for it I obviously am uh, an Aboriginal I'm Indigenous Australian myself but I just see the situation differently as plenty of Indigenous Australians do. I believe that changing the date doesn't gain anything. It's kind of, it, I think it's silly. I think to change the date that is the significant date, that's the day that already means something to so many people, is kind of sticking your head in the sand. It's a missed opportunity. It's kind of like cancel culture bullshit. Um, not about that. I think that you repurpose the day. I think that you take control of the situation and you say, hey, Australia Day is a thing. We all know what it is. Do you know how uneducated? The average Australian is that they actually think now uh, that uh, January 26 is when James Cook landed on Australia, landed on Australian soil. That ain't it. Um, it's it's it, it's and the dates are probably um, who knows how how accurate the dates are. But the the the, the story is that about a week earlier, um, a colony landed in in New South Wales. Uh, they didn't like the spot, Botany Bay, so they moved on down the coast and on about a week later on january the 26th they they um they, they raised the english flag the union jack um on uh, uh at sydney cove and that's what the day signifies right but it's obviously a larger picture what what, what their secret what, what it signifies so people don't even really know what they're celebrating and um i think it's an opportunity to educate Educate on your, our own history. For some reason, I feel like people know more about American history, names, you know, American names uh, throughout history than they do about, you know, about our own history. They know more about uh, the War of Independence and the the, uh, uh, the, the Confederate War, you know, the, the North versus the South, to, at the, the push to, to abolish slavery. We know so much about American culture and a lot of Australians don't really know a whole lot about our own history, um, which is pretty embarrassing, and that's you know that's that's on the schooling system really. But this is an opportunity to to educate and to highlight some of the horrible atrocities that were done. Um, you know, like commiserate with the Indigenous Australians about what what happened during that time period and what today signifies. And I think that it's a time to help uh, to to bridge gaps. To form new relationships and, and and open up new conversations, and uh, I, I think that abolishing the date or changing the date is just. I think a lot of Aboriginal people feel that way, but I don't think that they've thought it all the way through. I think it's the sentiment. I get the sentiment. I understand the sentiment behind it, but I don't think it's a finished thought. I think if you follow it through further, you go, "Hey, man, we don't want to celebrate." what you're celebrating today we want to talk about what happened and what this means to our people and what this means to the indigenous cultures of australia and this is the great opportunity to do that because you guys are all jumping up and down drinking beers waving the australian flag around and watching fireworks well how about we start the day with a little bit more education a little bit more conversation a little bit more discussion and and actually get down to some, some semantics about what happened and what this means and and then try and bridge it a bit bit by bit year by year this isn't it's all going to happen on australia day it's certainly not going to happen on one australia day but let, let, let this be symbolic of that conversation and highlight the fact that we're having that conversation and then we all try to move forward and celebrate the rest of the day together. The rest of the day, there's plenty to celebrate. Celebrate The fact that we live in Australia, one of the best countries on earth, the fact that there's so many opportunities, even though there's inequality and there's still racism and the system still sucks. Hey, guess what? The system sucks for white and black. I think the last couple of years has showed us that. So let's celebrate what we have in common, celebrate what's going right for us and, and um, look at moving forward. That's my my opinion on the situation. Uh, I just feel like, as I said, a lot of Aboriginal, a lot, a lot of Aboriginal people feel like change the dates the right way to go. I don't think it's a finished thought, and and I just think that it's been pushed along by 
um, you know, the white progressive movement, the, the whites that love to jump on and just, you know, virtue signal and, yeah, yeah, change the date, yeah, white, white. Because you heard some Aboriginal people say it and you just said, this is a good way for me to show what a fucking great person I am. I'll jump in on that. You, 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 you don't even know what they you, – you, you see guys like RV Yemeni from Rebel News out there, he, he replays some clips from a year or two ago where he goes to a change the date rally, he's interviewing all these white people and he's going, why do you want to change the date? And they don't want to even talk to him. He says, what, why are we changing the date? What does the date sign, signify? And they can't even give him a straight answer as to what actually happened. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I don't want to talk about semantics. I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about uh, uh, the semantics around the date. And he says, well, you're here to change the date. So we are talking about semantics. And, and the whole gist of these conversations he's having is that there's so many people out there protesting and virtue signaling and saying, I'm doing it. I want to change the date. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I don't even know what the fuck they're talking about. So how about we educate those little pricks? How about we educate Australians who just fucking, who, who don't give a fuck and think it's great to just be bogans and fucking fuck the indigenous culture of Australia. How about we educate them or if not them, at least their kids, at least have the conversation and maybe someone, it'll, it might not just fall on deaf ears and try and move like forward, you know? fucking change the date just stop with that all right let's 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 hijack the date if you want make it mean something make it mean something more to other cultures uh, and other people other than just the one group of people that it means something to how about that that's more ballsy that's more fucking revolutionary that's actually getting shit done so that went on for longer than i expected it to but i do feel passionately about this so there you go. That's my take. The average man's take on Australia Day and the change the date movement. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited. I'm in a bloody good mood. We booked our holiday to Bali today. We booked the accommodation. I need to book flights as well. Um, we booked our first first trip to Bali in four years, man. If you've been listening along to the podcast, we we were booked in to go to Bali in, in March of 2020, and I can't remember the actual date now. Um, it was like you know, 15th, 16th, 17th, somewhere in there. We were literally the first week of flights that got cancelled, leaving internationally flying out of Australia. Uh, it was like crazy at the time to think that you have to cancel your flight, you have to cancel a holiday because there's a virus and people are, are getting sick. It was like, what are we, that's surely not, that's not going to happen. We won't have to cancel our Bali holiday. Nah, that would be sweet. Sure enough, I can, you know, I think you could have flown out of the country, but you wouldn't have been able to get back in. I think that was the deal. But we had to can our bloody flight, man. Um, it ended up working out for the best because my, my dog, Casper, my old faithful the best dog I've ever fucking owned in my life. Um, best dog I've ever known in my life. He, he died that week. And, you know, we would have been in Bali. And that would have fucking broken me. So that worked out. And, you know, we ended up using the credit eventually last, like, not the year, just not the Christmas just gone, but Christmas before that, um, between 2021, 2022, we used the, the, the flights and the, the hotel credit shit somewhere else down in Perth. Um, which was supposed to be Darwin, but that got cancelled because of COVID as well. So we ended up getting, you know, we got our money's worth essentially. But yeah, man, it was crazy. We actually had to cancel our fucking Bali flight. So now it's just you think, yeah, that's what happened. People cancelled flights and holidays and everything. It's fucking turned upside down. But in the start of March 2020, that wasn't a thing, man. You didn't cancel holidays, you cancel flights. That was a big deal. It was sort of you know, unheard of in a lot of ways. So yeah, that, that happened. Um, that's that's fucking crazy, man. So yeah, first holiday to Bali in four years, man. I'm so I'm so excited. We're going to the, whole, the to the hotel that we went to last time we were there, the Mandira in Legian. It's a beautiful beach, with white like like a, a a beautiful pool with like a white sandy beach as an entry into the pool. There's water slides there. It's a big day bed you can hire for the day. We've got like a suite, it's family suite with like beautiful sun lounges out the front, like a little nice you know, boutique sort of um, um, style inside. 
it's right, literally right across the road from the from the ocean zone. Just go out the front and walk across the road and go for a surf out the front of the hotel. Uh, there's a big cocktail bar like made out of bamboo and shit on the very at the front of it called the Azul Bar. Beautiful man, I'm so excited. The kids are excited. Haven't been for so long, so I'm so pumped for that man. Go. I can't wait, can't wait. We're going for 12 nights too. We booked a good holiday. We booked a good one, mate. Like, haven't been for four years. Uh, we get some some money money back from flights and whatnot through um, work. Um, so it was like, make it worth it. Let's go over there. And, and once we get there, it's not that expensive. It's the getting there and the getting back. It's the cost is a lot. Accommodation does cost as well, but where we're staying. But for the most part, it was, you know, getting over there, it, which is the big deal. So... Stay there for 12 nights, make it worth it. And I can't wait, wait. wait. Um, also, so we get back from Bali and like a week and a half later is um, Easter. So we've got, we've got Easter booked up in um, RAC Caravan Park in, in Broome uh, as well. Probably like half of that Port Hedland Felt. It's about half the town there last year. So I wonder how many go on this year now. COVID's loosened up a bit. But um, definitely it was, it was choppers with Hedland was last year for Easter, which is good. Nice caravan park at Cable Beach there, right next to Divers Tavern. You've got a pool there. Just bloody mint. Bloody mint. So I'm looking forward to that, mate. The kids are cool with that one. Yeah, yeah. A couple of holidays booked in. This is how we used to roll. We used to roll with holidays planned in advance throughout our year. So we had little checkpoints to work to so that it didn't feel like a fucking 12 month slog you were, you were trying to get through each year, man. Getting burnt out by the end of the year. I plan on doing things. A little different this year, so yeah. See how that pans out. I'm pretty, pretty excited, man. Pretty stoked. Um, I'm also, I'm also. Uh, we, we had three weeks off. Uh, I stayed pretty active, pretty healthy while we were away. I went diving a couple of times, went surfing a few times. I ran a lot of times, a lot of days while I was down there. We came back in, in in pretty good shape. Like you always slip a little bit. The diet goes a little bit haywire, but but I didn't go crazy on the food. I definitely stayed active and physically fit. Um, so I came back to work and and work was fine and jumped back into the gym. And it was about a week or so of of, of picking up the slack. And I'm kind of full guns blazing again now, which is good. Um, and I'm kind of doing a little bit different this year. I'm starting the year by um, training to put on a bit of a bit more muscle around my uh, my legs and my shoulders um just i don't know i don't know what what decides what makes me decide what i'm going to train and how and what my goals are but i just kind of i just wing it and i think you know i feel like put on I'm, I'm 40 years old this year i feel like it's a good time to put on a bit of muscle definitely help protect the aging body um, bone density is massive. Muscle, def, you know, muscle mass as you get older is a, one of the most effective ways to, for, at least physically, to fight aging. So I'm all about putting on some muscle in my 40s, mate. And you know, the legs are skinny as as, as hell. So these bloody skinny jinners that I roll with. So there's definitely some room for muscle to go there, and, and the shoulders as well. They've been one of my weak weakest points through, uh, throughout the years. I've had, you know all up over 40 dislocations throughout between both shoulders. Not for many years now, but so the shoulders is something that I've always had to concentrate on and keep nice and strong and healthy. Um, so that's the, that's the plan at the moment, lifting a bit heavier and just changed up the way I'm lifting. I've gone to for some of the compound movements like squats, deadlifts, um, um, bench press. Uh, I've gone to five sets of five rather than like three or four sets of eight or ten. So lower sets, um, but more lower reps, more sets. Um, yeah, and and which is kind of good strength and muscle building uh, technique. So I'm feeling good at the moment. Not really too sore. Like the, the workouts hurt. I am sore for, for for days after each workout. That's fine. And. I'll probably keep doing this until the little niggles start coming in, like the tweaks in the tendons and the ligaments and the sore elbows and wrists. And you know that's te- typically what happens when I lift heavy for a period of time. So once that starts starts happening and I get sick of being sore and and, and yeah, little tweaks pissing me off, I'll, I'll change the objective and, and find a new goal. You know, get you know cardiovascular more fit, which is probably tie in better once the heat's gone. Anyway, you can look at running more again and doing circuits and cardio and doing more shit outside because 
it's a bit hard to, to run in Hedlock at the moment. Um, I did do a lot of running, as I mentioned, over the, the Christmas break. Um, and I listened to, to the latest David Goggins book on the way down, which was, um, it was good. I have listened to his first book, Can't Hurt Me, and I've heard a couple of his podcasts he's done with Joe Rogan. And the Can't Hurt Me was you know, an interesting book that just didn't really speak to me. And then I kind of always thought, fuck, live and it just it seems like he doesn't have any fun and he's uh, got a massive chip on his shoulder and he doesn't relax and rest and just, just didn't seem like a healthy or fun way to live life. Um, but his second podcast he did with Joe Rogan, what he was saying made a lot of sense to me. I thought I'll give the book a try. So I listened to it on the way down to uh, Perth and finished it off while we, while we were down south. And it, and it really resonated with me, mate. It's, 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 he talks a lot about the fact that you, it's called Never Finished and the fact that you never finished, you know, that you never have arrived anywhere. You've always got to keep working hard and about having a disciplined mind frame. And just he, he distinctly talks about the fact that it's not a self-help book. Um, but if you are the kind of person that's motivated already and committed to changing your life for the better incrementally day by day, then this is like a toolkit. He gives you the tools to do that, to make that transformation if you're already motivated and willing, um, committed to putting the work in, which is a cool way of looking at it. This won't motivate you. This won't change your life. This isn't a self-help book. If you're self-helping yourself, then here's a toolkit to actually help you get the job done, which is, a, I think, a pretty, a pretty cool way to look at it. And sure is, man. Dude's a fucking badass. He's got some, some awesome uh, stories and mindset and, and techniques that he does to, to push himself and the way he, helping you look at life through his lens, if only for a period of time, um, you know, helps. It helps, um, I believe, it, it helps if you're um, on that pathway, on that journey. So. So what I was doing was I the book, listened to the book all the way through. Then I said I was I was running while I was down there, and finding it hard to be, stay motivated some days because you know you've been drinking it later, you know more than usual, staying up later at night, eating different kind of foods, not really in my normal routine. So I started going back and look, listening to some of the the David Goggins book while I was running instead of using, and it's it's it certainly leaves very little room to bitch out of a run when you're listening to David Goggins talk about, you know, this guy does 250 mile runs. It pushes through all sorts of fucked up pain and extenuating circumstances and overcomes all these odds and injuries. And you listen to him talk, exactly. but you listen to them talk about what he does and how he does it and the mind frame. And, and you're running and you feel like stopping or cutting the run short. It's like, well, I can't really fuck do that because I'm going to feel like a big, bitch in the world while I'm listening to Goggins. So it's been really good motivation for me as far as um, running goes. Uh, so that was a good book. I enjoyed that. And I also started the Outliers book by Malcolm Gladwell, which is, you know, about Outliers. It, it's all right. There's some good information in there. The dude's voice is a bit annoying. And I feel like he kind of tight. He kind of oversimplifies things a little bit. But I'm only in the early days of the book, so I will listen to the whole thing. I will persist. But um, I wouldn't recommend it at this stage of the game. Let me just finish the book and uh, get back to you and see if I think it's any any good, worth worthwhile. Um. So yeah, where are we? Where are, what am I up to? Um, the UFC. The UFC. Uh, 2023, we had the first fights a couple of weeks back. First main event was last week, which was the open uh, UFC light heavyweight title fight, and then the bottom, and then the, the small spies, the, the um, flyweights, uh, which was for the flyweights. That was the fourth time these two cats have fought each other: Brandon Moreno and Davidson Figueredo. Um, so they were Figgy was two to one to Moreno, and obviously Moreno got the win uh, stoppage. On, on last weekend, so he is the undisputed flyweight champion. I think he's sending the other guy, Figueredo, upper weight division, so they, they won't fight each other anymore. I don't think anyone's ever fought each other four times in the UFC before. There's been some some three 
fight, like some trilogies in the past, but um, never never a full fight, you know, quadrility, whatever the fuck you call it, quadrility. I don't know if that's a real word for it. Um, but yeah, it's the it's the the first time that's happened. And it's been put to bed soundly, so which was which was a good a good finish. Um, but next month, next month is exciting, mate. Next month is the um, UFC Perth. I'm not going. Uh, I've been to one live event before. That was uh, Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm UFC, whatever it was in in Melbourne. You know, nine years ago thereabouts. And that was great. That was bloody great. Uh, uh, it was, I hated seeing Ronda lose, but you know, it was a great fight, great atmosphere, great experience. Mark Hunt fought, Bigfoot Silver on that card. I think Robert Whittaker fought on that card as well. So that was cool, man. Uh, Yohan and Yen Jacic was the champion. She fought on the, on the, as the co-main event as well. It was a great bloody night of fights, great experience. It was awesome. So in the, in the city there in an apartment and walking down to Eddie Head Stadium, cruising around down like on street in the evening having dinner and wine and I think Em's may have been pregnant uh, or no I think she may have fallen pregnant on that trip so this was just three kids which was pretty cool loved it it was a great time but um, I'm not going to this one but it's um it's, it's going to be good man there's well first of all Robert Whitaker was supposed to fight again and his opponent uh, dropped out due to contractual reasons which just pisses me off this this, this cat Paul Acosta who was going to fight He's a middleweight contender. He has had a you know, rough couple of years since he lost his first fight ever to that, that, the current champion at the time, Israel Adesanya, Kiwi fella, uh, a couple of years back. And then he's been a little bit hit and miss. And, and he's always moaning about wanting more money and a better contract. And he's pulled out of the fight because he wants more money. And it's like you're not even a, a like contender at the moment. Uh, he's still top five. He's not like a full contender. And um, the, like the UFC doesn't give the UFC just the, the UFC just shelled Johnny John Jones for like three years or something because they had you know contractual disputes. Uh, they just let Francis and Garnu go because they've had contractual disputes over the last year or so. Uh, he is the reigning heavyweight champion in the world, one of the most marketable heavyweights of all time because the guy looks like an absolute killer. And they've just let him go. He will come to an agreement on the contract. With him. They don't give a fuck about some run-of-the-mill top five, top ten middleweight demanding more money. They'll just shelf the guy, man, which is, is what they do. They, You've got like three or four fights left on your contract. They have to offer you three fights a year. So what they do is they wait till you're injured or they wait till they know, you, they know you're on holiday or, they, or, or whatever it is and they offer you short notice fights with unfavourable matchups so that you say no and then they offer you three fights and you turn them all down in a year or you take a bad fight and you lose, your value goes down and, and they basically don't fight you. They sit you on the shelf and these guys don't make money if they don't fight. So he, he's playing the wrong game with cats who are used to this sort of shit and we, the fans, are the ones that suffer because he's fucking around um, trying to get more money than he doesn't deserve uh, and going about it on, on, using a losing strategy. So it just frustrates me. I was a, I was a cock. Um, hopefully Whittaker still fights. Doesn't hasn't been any talk of that. Something that maybe that's off the table now, unfortunately. Um, but the main event is another Australian fella. It's um, Alexander Volkanovsky, who's the current featherweight champ, currently basically considered the greatest featherweight of all time. Um, he beat Max Holloway three times. He beat Ma Max Holloway, th Holloway three times. Max Holloway was uh, previously thought of as the best lightweight of all, uh, featherweight of all time because he soundly beat Jose Aldo, who was previously thought of the greatest featherweight of all time. So there's been this progression where Jose was, had like a 10-year domination run, kind of knocked him out um, for the belt. And then eventually him and Max fought. Max pieced him up. Max was on a, a tear as the greatest featherweight of all time, piecing everybody up. Then Volkanovski comes along, beats him three times and basically put that argument to bed. He is the greatest featherweight of all time. He's been untouchable. He's, I think he's lost one fight and he's 21 fights or something along those lines. It was like his first or second fight ever. 
So he's undefeated in the UFC. An amazing unbeaten um, uh, uh, streak. And he's coming up from featherweight to lightweight to fight the brand new lightweight champion, Islam Makachev, who's kind of considered, you know, to, he's only had, like I said, he's only just won the title, but people are, are really thinking he's going to be the next big thing at lightweight. He is a protege of, um, of Khabib Nurmagomedov, who was the lightweight goat for him, the guy that beat Conor McGregor, the guy that went um, 29 and 0 in his in MMA career, which is something that no one else has ever done. He beat the who's who of the division at the time. Um, he retired early, and his protege is Islam Makachev, and he's just won the belt off the guy Charles Oliveira. And everyone was touting Charles Oliveira as like he could be the greatest lightweight of all time because he had a really good run over the last two years. He knocked out a bunch of like you know Hall of Fame lightweight guys, you know ex champions and guys who were who were just really really top of the heap. But he, he beat them all like soundly. Um, however, there was a lot of I won't say luck, but 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 um, uh, favorable circumstance in each one of his big wins where it could have gone the other way. So I wasn't 100% sold that he was the best lightweight ever, but he definitely looked for the goods. He was definitely super dominant. He definitely beat a string of really, really, like, the best lightweights out there. And then Makachev comes along and handles him quite easily. So he's now, which people are already talking about how good he is, and then he, he fights the champ and does that to him. So it's kind of like he's this amazing new like uh, version of Khabib that's out. Everyone thinks it's going to be the the, the next best thing, the, the greatest lightweight behind Khabib of all time, all this sort of shit. And our boy, the Aussie, Volkanovski, who's the greatest featherweight of all time, is stepping up a division to come and challenge him in Perth in February next month. Fucking awesome, man. A lot of people are writing Volkanovski off because of how good Islam Makachev is and because of the size difference. But the thing about Volk is he's a short dude, stocky dude. Yeah, sure, he's a featherweight. But he used to be 110, 115 kilos. He's a rugby player. He's lost a lot of muscle and, and size to come down to be the size that he is now. Uh, I think he can naturally put on muscle and it not be uh, forced and it not be out of place on his frame. And I think he can get quite heavy, quite strong, quite bulky and be a real handful for someone who's a predominantly a wrestler which Michael Chevy is to, to deal with. He's got speed, he's got footwork, he's got great striking, he doesn't get himself in silly positions and get hit with big clean shots. So you really the the you know the the you're banking on submitting this guy, which Michael Chev could do, but I think that's a lot harder said, a lot easier said than done with a guy like Volkanovsky. So super excited about that man. It's just um like I said, Makachev absorbed Oliveira's momentum. Um, Volkanovski has been doing it for a while. He's undisputed. Super excited about that fight. If he can step up and take out Makachev and stop that train, that is huge. That is huge. He'll be a superstar, man. And if he doesn't, like, if he doesn't get dominated, if he just gets beaten by the bigger champion, he just goes back down his weight class and keeps dominating guys there. So not a huge loss for him. Pretty, pretty excited about that fight. Pretty excited to watch that one next month. Um, it also looks like Conor McGregor is going to come back this year. Looks like he's making a return. I mean, he's massive at the moment, like physically, he's huge. And there's, um, it's, it seems as though, it seems like he's he's been taking steroids. It seems like he found a loophole where he can be out of the testing, the USADA testing pool, and he can actually take steroids to heal, help heal his, his fucking broken, snap in half shin bone. He got his last fight. Um, it's kind of crazy. He's got all these photos and he's like huge right now. He looks like a you know the size of a, of, of a big welterweight. He was a featherweight once upon a time, you know. So two two like two weight divisions below, and he's big. He's jacked. He's swollen. He's got all these photos of him online, like just fucking looking swole. And people are like he's out of the USADA testing pool. And it comes out that yeah, he is out of the USADA testing pool, and it's fully legal. Whatever he's done, he's found a loophole to exit the testing pool for a period of time. Then he enters it, he has to be clean and tested for, I think, four months, and then he can fight again. And no one knew this existed. No one knew this loophole existed. So Connor is such a fucking trailblazer. He's found a way to get out of the testing pool for USADA, take steroids for fucking a year, and then get back in the pool, clean up, and and and, and go fight, carrying the benefits of those of those years taking steroids, that year taking steroids and, and helping your leg heal properly, and then go on and fight and clean again, which, to be honest, you know, I, I love. I think it's fucking great. 
It's a possibility that TJ Dillashaw has taken a leaf out of his book. He's retired. He's got fucked shoulders, so he may get on the juice for the next year or so, try and heal his shoulders up, then re-sign with the UFC, go into the testing pool, clean up and go for another fight. He might just be done. Who knows, man? But look, look, I don't want silly, over-the-top, WWE-style steroid guys fighting in the UFC, right? Like, I'm not about this freak show. Um, guys in there fighting, just looking ridiculous, right? But I am about TRT being legal again, testosterone replacement therapy, because these guys push their bodies so hard, they break their bodies down. There's so many different skills to, to tie together with the wrestling, the jiu-jitsu, now the sambo, you know, there's guys who are judo, you've got striking, there's Muay Thai, Taekwondo, there's karate backgrounds, there's boxers. You've got to tie everything together. And they're very different in the way they move, the way they stand, the distance that they fight at. Uh, all these things, right, you have to tie it all together. There's so many skills to learn. Um, and, you know, and, and you've got you to gotta fight injury along the way. They only fight two or three times a year. And, and, and by the time guys start to get really good, quite often they're in their mid to late 30s and it's kind of nearly all over to be an elite fighter just because of speed and recovery, really, and timing. So... To get guys like that, to give them TRT like they used to do, it gets them another 10 years sometimes on their career. So they get to 36, 37, 38, they just start putting it all together. And then on TRT, and they get another good six, seven, eight, nine years where they can really put that all together and their body doesn't fail them. And we, the fans, get to see the, the best of these guys in their best, you know, mentally, at their best mentally with all the skills and without their bodies deteriorating and, and dropping away. So we, that we're the fans, we're the ones that win, mate. Um, I understand that there's some clean fighters who, who completely, you know, just don't want to compete against guys who are on, you know, testosterone. But from a fan's perspective, man, I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. And if guys can, like Connor can get out of the test and pull, heal his leg up, put a bunch of size on, come back, um, and still have to test clean before he fights, fucking hell, you know, I'm, I am, you know, for that, uh, yeah, that so probably an unpopular view, but uh, that's a point of view. So we are the fans, we're the ones that win because we get to see better fights against guys who we recognise because they've been around long enough to build up a brand. So yeah, pretty good men. Um, speaking of guys that like taking te um, steroids and fucking um, have been around for a while, John Jones is finally booked to fight again at heavyweight. So he's, this has been a, a, a two or three years coming. He left the lightweight division undefeated, fucking smashed everyone there, left the lightweight division, kept getting done for like drink trial and taking cocaine and smashing his misses and doing all sorts of stupid pop fucking uh, trace amounts of some steroid, like all sorts of stupid shit. Um, but he's come back as a heavyweight. He's taken like two years to put the weight on and he's like a legit heavyweight now and he's coming back to fight uh, Cyril Garn, who's like the number one contender at heavyweight. Uh, he would have come back and fought Ngannou, but as I just mentioned before, Ngannou has, has not signed with the UFC anymore due to contract dispute. So I'm actually not too sad about that. I thought that was a bit of a hectic fight to bring Jones back to, like after whatever it was, like three years since he's fought. Happy to see him fight somebody else. I think it's going to work out for the best that way anyway. Um, and it's a guy, he's a long, rangy, light, heavyweight, like light as in light on his feet, moves like a bit like a middleweight, so so the striking's going to be really high level, a lot of movement, not just big, lumbering heavyweights. Um, but, you know, it's John Jones, man. This guy's not a real knockout puncher, so you, you'd hate him to come back.